So the Bulgarians were the first ones to make success out of high frequency training, um, high specificity training under Ivan Abajev. Uh, they were kind of who put uh, this method on the world stage because they started winning a lot. Um, Ivan Abajev was kind of the coach 70s, 80s and 90s in that kind of period and they won a lot of gold medals. And so a lot of eyes obviously went on to them um, because of all the success. Um, you can do whatever you want with your methods. You can get really creative, really, you know, fantastically unique. Uh, but if you don't get the results, no one really cares. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of this happens to this day in every single genre of sport. People try and reinvent the wheel. People try and come up with something sexy and really interesting, but they don't have the results and no one really cares. It's only until you get the results that people try to kind of pay attention. Um, and a lot of people I've, I've, I've heard, um, even last night, people were saying, but dude, uh, they're on drugs. My response always to this is, who wasn't on drugs? Um, my assumption has always been, all the top level are on drugs. So that thing is out of the, the, the equation. That's not the question anymore. Um, so now we're talking about what else is unique about these people winning? The program. Just because somebody's on the program and taking drugs doesn't mean the program is bad. But the guy that's losing and taking drugs, what are we going to say about that? So for me, the drug story is always a weak argument for me because everyone's on drugs, man. Every single person on drugs. We just saw the American powerlifting team. They got banned or something like that. I don't even want to read into it because it's always the same damn story. Oh, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. This is unfair. This is unfair. But everyone everywhere seems to be on drugs. And so from my point of view, I'm like, okay, that's the norm. Take drugs if you want to take drugs, whatever, up to you. I'm not going to take drugs. Um, but I don't like hearing that argument. Um, oh, the Bulgarians won all those medals because they took drugs. I'm pretty sure somebody somewhere else in the world took drugs with their crappy uh, methods and no one really cared. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that to me is interesting is the, the, where is the origin of this high frequency training? Obviously, they made it popular, but there was a guy I read about um, who lived sort of like way, way before uh, this program came to through the Bulgarian method. A fellow by the name of Bob Peoples. I encourage you guys to Google him and read about him. His name is Bob Peoples. Um, he was some farmer uh, in America, just not even that special. He was just a farmer, right? He wasn't an athlete like the Bulgarians were training eight hours a day. This fella um, deadlifted something like 730 pounds, 720 pounds at 181 pound body weight. Um, and I think he also did it with double overhand grip, which is the most incredible thing I've ever heard in my life. I, I mean, he must have humongous hands um, and his grip must be insane. So this fellow was a farmer. Um, the story goes, he would go work as a farmer, right? <laughs> He's not a sponsored athlete posting on Instagram and freaking TikTok every day to make a living. Um, so this dude was just going about his farmer, farmer life. And then every day, uh, it wasn't, I don't think he was kind of like every single day, do or die. It was most days of the week. So up to seven days, obviously, but sometimes as low as four. Still, four days a week of, of deadlifting is very unique. Um, even for that time, even for, for today's uh, period, it's very, very unique for somebody who has such a high uh, lifting frequency, especially with the deadlift. The one lift that puts us all to shame when, when it comes to recovery and fatigue. So this fella will go to his basement. You have to remember that he didn't have these fancy plates and bars and, you know, ball bearing collars and all this sort of stuff. He just had a freaking bar. You can just imagine the quality of stuff now in the 1950s, 1940s. So he just basically went in his basement, get all these mismatched iron plates, put them on and lift. Um, and so he would work up to a single every single day, my understanding is. Um, and then sometimes, depending on how he felt, he would do back offsets. Um, but all of this stuff was done in a unique fashion where he had unique, um, very, very unique technique. So apparently he didn't care about his lumbar flexion. So he even encouraged lower back rounding. Um, he also didn't like taking big air into his belly. So he would blow out the air, round over, double overhand grip, 700 pounds. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that is damn impressive. And the fact that he was living where he was living and who he was and how he lived his life, I'm pretty confident to say that he wasn't on drugs. 1950s. So he, you know, so he, I think, pulled, 1949, he pulled that 720 in front of a whole bunch of people because, you know, people started 
um, paying attention to his strength and whatever. And so there was a picture of him kind of like on this little stage, a whole bunch of people around. So that was in, in 1949. So he would have been training like say, I don't know, 15, 20 years before that. So we're talking 1930s. Um, I don't think the drugs were around there, especially accessibility to this stuff. So he didn't have the access to drugs. He double over hand gripped, he blew the air out of his lungs and he pulled 700. Um, this makes me want to believe that my love-hate relationship with the deadlift over, the, over my time on, on this platform, over my time training, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I just have to get through this um, fog, um, something that John Bros spoke about, something uh, that kind of Max Aida uh, spoke about as well. When you first start the squat every day, it's, it's miserable. Um, but it's probably even more miserable with deadlift every day. So you need to be very, very careful about your volume. You need to be very careful about your emotional uh, arousal level. Um, you need to kind of lift calm and do all those things that I always talk about with the squat every day when you first start that. Um, you need to just basically give your time, give your biology time to get over this new thing. Um, <laughs> what I'm doing is squat every day and deadlift every day. So this is maybe a unique thing that I don't think both people squatted um, I'm not sure he might have, uh, but you have to remember back then probably they didn't have squat racks and all this sort of stuff. Um, I'm not sure about all that, but I would say he probably didn't squat. So he was just a, a deadlift, deadlift beast. Um, so when you're doing both of those things, you need to be mindful of both of those kind of fatigue curves. Um, this morning I came in once again with the, with the aim of hitting 180 for, for five singles. And I managed to do that this morning. Um, but the whole time I'm like, okay, no assumptions, no goals, come in, work up and see what the body tells you. Don't try and push the case. Don't try, don't try to push the agenda. Whatever the body says goes. So I kept saying that to myself, 140 moved well. So then I went to 180, that kind of moved well. I was, I was trying to be very, very careful how I lowered the weight. So that was probably, you know, even more strain on my lower back and, and posterior chain because of that. Well, it's five o'clock in the morning. So... If I start dropping the weights here, the whole freaking suburb will wake up. So um, this is why I'm not doing the kneeling kind of, um, you know, put the glutes on the map kind of uh, uh, approach to the bar because that will kind of bang and hit and whatever, make noise. Um, so then I just started doing this. Um, so my aim is to hit 180. 180 is around 70, 72% of my one rep max. I think 70% is a good single uh, to aim for each day. Um, once again, no assumptions. Whatever the body tells me, I'll do. Um, but it's certainly uh, encouraging. It's certainly uh, motivating, uh, inspiring to read about a guy like that, Bob Peoples. Um, 181 pounds, man, doing what he did. 700 pounds. So for, for, for me, I think 700 pounds, the, the units that I use, kilos, I think that's around 320 330 kilos or something like that that is astonishing man now the fella when i look at his the pictures of of you know of, of him deadlifting pulling he does look like a fella that's built for the deadlift he's got these you know uh wonky old arms uh long long arms um but it doesn't matter it doesn't excuse the fact that this fella was a laborer let's let's be um let's be real here in the 1930s and 1920s 1950s I don't think, you know, these machines that we see on the farms were readily available back then. Um, so this, I can imagine this fella was a laborer, essentially. He was, he was working like a maniac. I, I don't know what his farm was and what he did, but um, he, he was no nurse, man. I can tell you that. So if I can replace his laboring with the squatting, um, he did laboring every day and deadlift every day. Maybe I can do squatting every day and deadlift every day. And that's kind of the, the trade-off that we can have. But... It's, it's the hardest thing to do in, in, in life, I think, is to be a trailblazer, to be someone who's doing something different. But when you have a fellow like that, a Bob Peoples character that you can read up about and see that he survived, that he wasn't some freaking alien from Mars, um, he's just a regular guy with, with a vision, with a belief, and with the courage to kind of take on a goal, take on a, a challenge. And that's what he did. And so he proved to a whole bunch of people that this conventional stuff that we all led to believe might not be the only way to the top, might not be the only way. Um, what, what's interesting to me is that a lot of people, um, all the stuff that I've read, 
would definitely go against something like this because this this is not what science says. This is not what what all of our um, things say about everything. Um, this is this is not explained. Um, what this is, and if you look at you know 181 pounds, if you look at him, he doesn't have a whole bunch of muscle. He doesn't have a massive back or traps or you know whatever we talk about. You know in terms of strength, oh you need this, you need that, you need rowing, you need all these things. He just did the damn thing, man. He just did it over and over again. He made sure he didn't exhaust himself every single day, so he would leave something in reserve so he doesn't have too many recovery points to pay back. And he would just basically come back the next day and do the same thing again. Strength is a skill. And when I read about these type of stories, all I ever think about is strength is a skill. Um, I remember um, growing up um, and hearing people talk about their sporting kind of um, sporting uh, stories and whatnot. And I remember I had a friend who, uh, who played soccer. Um, and, you know, we were talking about, you know, his position, what position he was playing and whatnot. Um, he said that there was, I said, who's the striker? Like, you know, if you've got a good striker, does he make good leads and whatnot? And he said, yeah, yeah, he's, he's a really good striker. Um, and I said, but he looks kind of small and stuff. Like, you know, what's he good at? Like, he's, he's just really, really quick and he just kind of like runs around defenders and taps it in. The first thing he said to me was that he's got an incredible kick on him. And I remember saying to him, uh, saying to him, he's got a really good kick on him. He looks like a like a little shrimp, you know. I would never say that somebody like that would have a really good kick on him. Skinny guy, very very skinny, scrawny little kid. Um, and the first thing that somebody who plays with him said that he's got he's got a really powerful kick. And so at that time I was like, that makes no sense. And he said, man, when he would you give him a bit of space and winds that when he winds that thing up and he hits it, it's like a bullet. So I remember thinking about that back then and thinking, well, what, what is going on there? How can somebody that skinny and not strong looking produce so much force? Now, after all these years, I know that this is just a skill. Strength is a skill. Power is a skill. If you can teach your body to move efficiently through space, if you can teach your leg to swing at a specific time and hit the ball in a specific spot, you produce strength and power and, and, and speed. Um, just like Bog Peoples, man, he, you, would, you, you would walk past him in the shopping center and think nothing of it. You would never think that this guy looking like that, I mean, I, I walk past hundreds of these people every single day. I would never think 700 pound deadlifter, 700 pound deadlifter. Um, there's something about this type of training. It, it, it is mostly nervous system training. It is teaching your body how to fire those motor, neuron, uh, motor neurons in a, in, a, in a specific way to produce the most amount of power. That's what this is. This is what Squat Every Day is. A lot of people tell me, but you're not building muscle. You look like you don't lift. It's like telling, it's like telling Malcolm Schumacher, man, you train every single day. You don't look like you train. He's a freaking Formula One driver, man. Like, I, I get, I get where people are coming from. I'm not bodybuilding. I'm not interested in looking big and, and juicy and whatever else. All I want to do is get strong. All I want to do is get plates on that bar. I don't care how I look. The smaller I look, the better it is for my health, for my, for my, how I feel. Um, I've always said it. Every time I put on a bunch of ki uh, a few kilos, I feel it, man. I can't imagine what freaking Eddie Hall felt like with 200 kilos, or what Haftor felt with 220 kilos, whatever he is at six foot eight, six foot nine. I can't feel good, man. I don't know. You know, I feel best around 90, 92 kilos. That's my ideal. Right now, I'm 95. You know what I mean? And I'm not shredded. You know, there's definitely fat there. I, I want to lose some of that weight, definitely. Um, so that's kind of my mentality. I want to be a race car. I want to perform really, really well and weight reduction, the rest of the crap. I don't need an air conditioner. I don't need, you know, leather seats. I don't need all this sort of stuff. I don't need the back seat. I'm a freaking race car, man. I don't need all this stuff. I'm built for a purpose. I want to build my body to do a certain thing. Squat, deadlift, bench, really strong. I don't need fluff. Um, when I look at a guy like Bob, Pe Bob Peoples, I'm like, that's exactly what this dude would have said as well. I don't, I don't, I don't think this guy would have been like looking at, I don't know, well, who was around back then? I don't even know if Reg Park was back then. I don't even know who who what who or the bodybuilders was 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 it back then. Um, but I don't think this guy was impressed by physique. I don't know. To spend all day on the on the field farming and then come in, and and I don't know, spend half an hour working up to a max single, max training single, and maybe depending on how he felt, do some doubles, triples, on the back offsets. Man. I don't know about you guys, but that, that to me is so damn impressive. So impressive. That's exactly what I want to do with my training. Um, the trick for me is balancing. 
balance, balance, balance. I spoke yesterday about how the Bulgarians must have had more pulling to pushing ratio. Um, this morning, squatting felt good. I worked out to 180, you'll see that coming up. Um, felt good. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of fatigue in the system right now. Um, 200 doesn't look like it's possible because of this fatigue. And I, I basically do these tests every single day to see what my body's capable of and I can track it. Um, my body's tired, my body's tired, but that's okay. Next week or two, I'm allowing this, this introductory period into the introduction period into this whole new type of living. Um, let's see how it goes. Let's see how it pans out. Um, one of you guys actually commented on one of my old, old videos. Um, it's also titled squat every day. I think it's like 240, 250, something like that. And in bold letters, I wrote deadlift every day. I watched that video because one of the guys commented on it. One of you guys commented and I, I watched it. And I was like, wow, like that's where the seed was planted. That's where this first idea crossed my mind. And I, I watched the video and I basically opened up the video by saying that I want to do, I think it was three sets of 10 with 60 kilos every single day. Um, I don't have time right now. I'm about to go to work, but when I get back home tonight, I'm going to try and watch the videos around that period to see how many days I actually managed to do that. But the assumption was balancing out the hip girdle. That's what I was saying back then. Um, right now, I'm not doing volume. I'm doing basically high intensity deadlifting with high intensity squatting. Um, and so my, my thoughts, my, um, my thinking has evolved since then. That was kind of the planting of the seed. And it's funny how 400 days on, um, this, this seed has blossomed into another little idea. And, um, this is what I say to you guys all the time. You can read the same book five, six times and you learn something every time. So there's a lot of repeating stuff in my mind, but each time I, I get something out of it. So here we go. They lift every day. Um, that's how it pans out. I'm thinking about both peoples. I'm thinking about even Abhijay and the, and the boys from the Bulgarian weightlifting team. Um, let's work this out. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out.